right? So you're like, that's where the love, you know, the love affair happens. So you're like, okay. So then, and you guys can try some of these, right? So, you know, just gluing the wax paper over the photo, you know, is beautiful. And then what I say too is, you, you know, if you pull, if you pull the wax paper up on either side, do you see how when I curved it like this, now this photo is so much better, right? Because I'm not seeing it all sharp. I'm seeing it on a curve and the curve is created by the wax paper, which ultimately will be created by the wax because we can control the depth of the wax, right? So we can put the encaustic on thin, we can sculpt it, we can brush it, we can smooth it so that what's underneath becomes almost like we can control the visibility, right? Like a seesaw and go back and forth, right? And ultimately make a decision about where we want it to be. So in order to collage this, I just use a clear glue or a PVA glue, which is um, a bookbinder's glue. Um, and I coated over the photo and laid the wax paper down and then literally set it aside to dry. Like literally just put it away. And then I would come back into the studio like two or three days later and start and start to peel up pieces of the wax paper where I wanted to, what I thought was in what part of the photo I wanted to see, right? Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm moody, right? So one day I might like wanna see, you know, what like our shoulder and one day I might wanna, you know, so we're constantly changing as artists, right? So, and we might make something tomorrow that we think is like the best thing in the world. And then we're gonna keep working and we're gonna keep creating, and we're gonna keep learning and we're gonna look back on it and we're gonna be like, oh my God, I can't, I, I can't, no, like absolutely not. Like I would never work like that again. Or I can't believe I made that. So it's interesting too, how we change, which is why wax is so wonderful because it changes it, it, it's it's a great thing to grow with, right? It's like, you can you can just keep, you can go back and work on pieces later, or you can just say, oh, that's great for then. And this is what I do, you know, now. And you can continue to grow. Um, so the encaustic conference is a great reference. Joanne Matera is a great reference for encaustic painting. Also, there are two manufacturers of paint. So there's R and F, Paints, which is in um, Kingston, New York. And also ironically, the other paint company called Encausticos is also in New York, in Rochester. So, and you guys know that Rochester, right, is the history of photography, right? Because the Eastman Kodak and all of that stuff was there. So it was like perfect for me. I was like, oh, Rochester. Yeah, paint, encaustic paint company, photographer. Like it was uh, like born to be together, right? And in a weird way, I do feel like that. I do feel like, like for me, wax and black and white photos were just born to be together. So there were photographers too, way back when, like, I don't know if you guys know, like Edward Steichen. Let me just see if I can pull up a couple of his pictures real quick. So the pictorial list, everybody knows the pictorial list, right? So they made pictures like this, right? And to me, all these pictures look waxy, <laughs> right? They so, do. Don't yeah. they? Yeah. I mean, I think that, I mean, I think I'm definitely stuck in like, I'm stuck either in 1970 or like 1920, right? <laughs> but like every 50 years, maybe. Um, so supposedly like they used beeswax to cover prints, which would make like, this looks totally wax, right? So I always, it was kind of like my, I guess in a way my crutch because mixed media photography was sort of in my education was kind of frowned upon. 
right? That people were like, oh, that's not that important or, oh, that's not real photography. Um, or once you add something to it, it's not a real true photographic image. And part of me was like, okay, I don't care. Like, okay, whatever. And then part of me was like, well, I, I love photography. I don't want to be excluded from this arena. So I, it was, it was interesting for me. And, and I was happy that other photographers use wax, right? In history, that it was historically like, okay. The other thing about wax is it's totally organic. So it's non-corrosive, right? So, you know, people get all like about painting being archival. I mean, wax is definitely archival. Okay, so we use it as a preservative. Um, it's not going to do anything corrosive. So that's, that's super. Um, the history of encaustics also goes back to 800 AD. So I think it's always nice to kind of remember how long people have been using wax in art. And it's really fun to study the history of encaustics because generally still, even though it's more popular, when you say I do encaustic painting, people go, what? Right, they're like, what, what do you do? And then you're like, oh, I paint with bees, and they're like, uh, okay. But <laughs> I, still, I still think that there's like a, like a disconnect where unless they see it, they don't understand what you're saying, right? Which is, it's like, okay. People understand acrylic painting, oil painting, watercolors. So maybe if encaustics stay this popular, pretty soon people will be like, oh yeah, and encaustic painting. Oh yeah, like I've seen that, right? So that's our job to educate people, right? Make a lot of encaustic art. Um, so I don't make my own paint. I know that some people do or, or want to. Um, I have, I'd say the closest thing that I've done to making my own paint would be like really simple stuff from the kitchen, which we can talk about if anybody is interested in making, um, adding pigment to their wax medium. You know, you could think about things that are very safe and in your home, like turmeric, right? Or um, cay cayenne, um, those, are, and those are sort of like those orange cumin, right? You could also try mustard. If you want to grind something like that, you could try, you know, like if anybody has like a poultice bowl, like a bowl, you know what I'm talking about? If you want to try to do that, you could try it with something that you have in your kitchen um, and make your own colors, right? So that is possible. I mean, that is the basic formula of encaustic is beeswax, resin, and powdered pigment. Um, I have done some of that stuff and it is really beautiful. And it does go back to those very earthy tones that I was talking about, like with photography, where I liked, you know, selenium tone, tea toning, coffee toning, wine toning, walnut ink toning. So you can just picture those colors as being all like kind of like Jen's background. All those woody, like the wood box, like, right? Like walnut colors, wood colors, right? those pretty colors, um, yellows, purples, browns. So those would be those colors. Um, I basically in my studio use hot plates. So I don't use um, like RNF cells. I use this, just these basic um, pancake griddles. And they come in different sizes. I know like when we were in Texas, um, there were some larger ones, right? And I keep, I usually paint with like two or three at a time and I keep them at 175, right? Now you have to remember with a pancake griddle, 175 is not an exact temperature. So you could always buy an additional table, a uh, uh, heat thermometer. Sometimes I go up to 200 and you also need to sort of be aware of your, temperature of your space that you're working in. So um, if you're in a house that's warm or in a garage that's slightly cooler, that's gonna make a difference, okay? Also the seasons make a difference. So my wax is totally different in the summer 
right? Painting in the summertime is totally different than painting in the wintertime. Hmm. Right? So you, this is again where you can use your skill set and what you know about the nature of wax, right? So that's, that's another really kind of interesting kind of way to think about learning this is like the nature of wax. So it, it, it's like asking a material to, you know, make sure you're asking the material to do what it does well, right? So I think we always need to kind of connect with what we want and what we're actually working with, right? Because mm -hmm. that's a lot of times where I see people getting into trouble is that the wax is maybe just not what they really want to be working with. Mm -hmm. So knowing more about what wax really does consistently will help you understand how to use it, when to use it, right? And give you better, make you feel more satisfied with your results, right? So you're not expecting it to look like something else. So there is kind of a range in wax and we can talk about that too. What I called like light to heavy, right? Or what we could almost call translucent to opaque, right? And under that spectrum of like, being able to see through it and to be totally not see through it, both are possible. And then there's also sort of this other pull, push and pull, which is like smooth, like glass to totally textured, right? Right. And honestly, if we wanted to draw like one more line, we could do th like thin to thick, like really thick. I mean, I've seen people do, you know, like literally drip castles of encaustic wax off of panels so that you actually had a significant height to the piece, right? You can also build stuff, you know, if you want to go 3D or explore something 3D, we can talk about that too, is like literally how to use maybe paper or cardboard and wax to build, to literally build, you know, three-dimensional surfaces, okay? So the possibilities and sort of uh, longitude and latitude of the medium are kind of amazing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and as amazing, also sort of like uh, uh, daunting, right? Like, oh my God, like, what do I do? <laughs> you know, and where, where do you start? So that's why we can take it really nice and slow in this class and our time together, and we can just start very simple. So I thought the best place to start um, would be with just wax medium, right? So that's just using the wax medium, right? So when I buy wax medium, I just go ahead and buy it in a five, five pound. Oh my God. And I think Jennifer, how many pounds did, did uh, Heather had? She had like a 50 pound box or something. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that's, I've never bought that box. I think it's like, I, I want, the, I want it though. Now I can't get this open. This is a good place to break though. If you guys have questions or if you want to just stretch your legs or uh, go to the bathroom, I'm going to try to open this bottle if I can. I don't know why it's never really stuck before. Does anybody have any questions? Um, so when we, oh, go ahead. Oh. You go. Oh, thanks. Um, when you do photographs, yes. What type of paper does it yes. need to be on? Excellent question. So I say try, try it all, right? So I have literally, I put wax on every single thing I could possibly put wax on. <laughs> because I, I mean, in a way, it's almost like, well, why not, right? Because A, if you have it in your studio, why not try it? And B, who knows if it's gonna, you know, maybe it'll look really cool. So think about that question though, for a second. What we know about wax is it's hot, right? And it goes on hot. So it's like 175 or 200 degrees or whatever. And 
if it goes on something that has like a resin coating on it or a glossy coating, what do you think is going to happen between the hot wax and the glossy coating? It's going to melt it. It's going to melt it. So maybe that maybe you want maybe that you want to do that. Right? So you got to think about you're definitely using like fire. You know, I think you sent me a cute message, Jen, about burning something in your house or something. <laughs> you're gonna have to run outside with your torch. Sorry, I got something in my eye, you guys. Um, so if you if you do use plastic coated photographs, which are anything with a glossy surface is a plastic coating, you're gonna burn it. Right? If burning is what you like and you want to make art that's about fire and burning and crystallization, decomposition fracturing, then you definitely want to use a glossy surface, right? But you're standing on slippery slope. You can't control that. You'll have zero, you will have zero control. There's no way to sort of AKA stop the burning or control the burn, you know, or only, right? Mm -hmm. So, so you could be fine three quarters of the way and then all of a sudden have a uh, the photo emulsion just come right off on the brush, mm. right? Mm -hmm. But maybe that's really beautiful, <laughs> right? I mean, maybe you really love that look. Okay, so I say I don't. I don't. That's I. That's too. It's too insecure. I can't control it. I. I don't. I don't want to put my. I don't want to put my whimsy so to speak my je ne sais quoi my unknowns in that arena okay so i choose to put them in other places so i always start with um inkjet prints and um inkjet prints on um like a matte paper okay but i have definitely poured wax actually today ironically with my sixth grade they wanted they 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 wanted to see me on martha stewart and i was like mm, uh-huh so they you can find it you can find miss leah you can find it so i did i found it and uh 2009 on national television we poured wax over a glossy or no sorry probably a matte rc print from like the lab hmm. and it didn't burn you know, I was lucky. I pulled that <laughs> off, but I wouldn't want to, you know, and I think that pouring is probably okay. I don't think that the, because what happens to the wax when it, if you have a photo, let me just grab a photo. Hang on. These are just some little, these are some little samples I'm making. So if you just have like a photo mounted to a wood panel, right? So just like this. Now this is not RC and this is not glossy, but what's gonna happen is that you're gonna take the hot wax from the hot plate and you're gonna pour it onto a cooler surface, right? So you're kind of gonna have the, the coldness of this surface on your side. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the wax isn't going to be dominant anymore. It's heat. It's leaving its heat source and moving to something cold. So it's going to kind of just go like, ah, you know, like freak out. It's not going to be that impulsive. So what really would burn your photo with the, if you had a resin coating or a glossy coat, is going to be your heat gun or your fusing layers, right? Mm -hmm. And then I have seen brushes, brush strokes move emulsion. So that's, that can happen too. If you're really brushing with a hockey brush, wax on a RC or a coated photo, you can remove the emulsion. No, no emulsion is 100% fixed, right? So, mm -hmm. and I sort of think that I like that because I'm able to sort of move this surface around with sandpaper, or any type of like, you know, um, roughness, or I can scratch in it, you know, so it's, it's a soft, it's not a permanent surface, a photograph, right? Mm -hmm. 
So I like that Im imperfect sort of, uh, you know, roughness that I can do to it. Um, I don't know, like everybody with photography and imagery is like across the board, you know, what people have at home, what they know about printing. Um, and to be totally honest, <laughs> to be totally honest, I was a darkroom printer. So I didn't know, you know, digital didn't happen until the middle of my career, right? So, um, I mean, I think I'm doing an okay job printing. I have an Epson um, 3880, which is the lowest, you know, that's the cheapest Epson that they make. Um, I think they make a nice Canon in that same price range. So it's like the 600 to $800 printer range. And the problem, you know, it's great. It works fine. It's, it's reliable. The problem is, is that the cartridges are like $85 a piece. Yeah. And there's 14, 14 cartridges. Wow. Yeah. Now, of course, they don't all go empty at the same time. Thank God, you know, it's not like one goes, they all go because then it would, you know, then you're like, wait, buy a new printer or replace the cartridges. Right. So, right. So that, but they do go, I mean, I probably buy one or two cartridges a month and I print fairly regularly. I mean, not a ton, but I print regularly. Um, what about the weight, Leah? Like the weight of the paper? How do you feel yeah. about getting a heavier weight versus, is it an aesthetic choice or like a functional choice? So, so that's a really good, really good question. And I've been through it with paper. I've been through every weight. I've manhandled and wrestled paper to boards. I've glued double weight fiber-based papers to panels and cried my eyes out, you know, trying to get air bubbles out. So from my experience, this is what I'm going to say is that the thinner the paper, the freaking easier it is to deal with. Okay. Because the image is the image, like it, it, the image is on there. And you, if you're, if you're in it, like I, if you're in it, like I'm in it, I'm in it to use the image as a starting point or a sketch, right? And that sounds like I'm not belittling that sketch. I mean, I work hard for my photos. I hire models. I spend days. I plan them. I, you know, I, I, I edit them. I do, you know, Photoshop, whatever. I'm not saying I take my images lightly. I'm just saying that when you actually go to print them, the thinner the paper, the easier it is for you to work with and for you to be able to safely and smoothly adhere it, attach it to a board. And I only say this out of experience. So that's a really good question. I mean, I used to use a material called Yes Paste. Has anybody ever heard of Yes Paste? Mm -hmm. So I love Yes Paste. And honestly, in that video in 2009, there I was with my RC prints and my Yes Paste. And I would never use either of those materials now. So the problem for me with Yes Paste is that it's, it's water soluble, which also means that it's affected by humidity. So over the years, right, if it's exposed to a certain amount of moisture in the air, it's gonna loosen the glue. Mm. And it doesn't seem to matter how much wax is on top of it. If the glue lifts, the whole thing will lift. Right. So also because of the weight of the wax, it'll almost like kind of want to like pull it off a little bit. So, I mean, and I'm not talking about like all my work from 10 years ago. I'm talking about like some few pieces I have in my studio that are not climate controlled stored that have been exposed to humidity, you know, are coming up. And, but that's enough to be like, I'm not using that glue anymore. Mm -hmm. That's enough for me. So now I use uh, only strictly PVA glue, which I find is stronger. And I actually use 
some wood glue, like die hard hardware store. Like my dad would use it on a, a, a frame or a piece of furniture. I use this, hang on. I mean, like now I'm like, no joke. I'm like, you're not coming off. <laughs> okay. Like, because this is physical. Okay. It's getting physical. I'm like out here using all my strength and energy to glue you guys together. And guess what? You're going to stay together. So this is tight bonds, premium wood glue. And nothing will come. I mean, no piece of paper will come off of this. <laughs> and so okay so i may so again you have to remember these are ex every day being in the studio making a ton of work working commercially producing shows every year twice a year i'm out here all the time so this is my new best friend because right and then this is my new best friend this is 90 gsm lightweight rice paper <laughs> So it's ironic though, after all these years, what did I end up with you guys? <laughs> super strong glue and very lightweight paper. But this goes back to what I was saying earlier about making decisions that work for you, right? I'm gonna make a new poster. It's going to be my new slogan, power women, Amer like American women, right? 2021, what works for you? <laughs> no, no joke. So I'm, and I'm not, I'm really not kidding. So these combinations are your choice and they're going to affect the way the work looks. They're going to affect how you work in your studio. They're going to affect how your shoulders feel the next morning. They're going to affect how your feet feel three days from, you know what I'm saying? Like it's all, they're going to affect the wrinkles, right? Like it's all part of your art life, your life, where you want to put your energy. So wait, just, just let's throw something out there too. You can go online and you can purchase an image mounted or printed on wood and you can get that mail to your house and just take it out of the box and start painting it okay so why do you need to work on photoshop print it glue it sand it paint on it why do you need that i mean i'm, I'm not saying yes or no i'm just putting it out there that these are choices that you, the artist, need to make. This, that part of it for now is still in my practice. There could be a day where I do outsource that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. I don't, because I don't have the energy or the time or the whatever to, to print it, trim it, gl roll, glue it, and you know, sand it. Like the that's a lot of work. Now and right now I value that work as my style, my style, right? As part, but could I get rid of it? Absolutely. So I can share a couple of um, resources for you if anybody wants to try. And this is a great, so I present you with these challenges, right? As we're sort of coming up to these obstacles of process to find another way. So for example, one of my student assistants, I talk about her all the time. She didn't have a lot of money. She was in art school. She was shooting a film camera. She was getting her roles of film developed at CVS. She was taking the proofs from the CVS to the staples down the street walking. She didn't have a car. She would put the prints Xerox copies and sometimes the Xerox machine would be acting weird or broken. So she'd get like weird lines and crazy colors, right? And then she would come to my studio, pick my trash and borrow some glue, right? And glue her funky, weird, messed up, inexpensive Xerox copies to trash and then paint them with wax. And honestly, 
they were really beautiful. Right. So, and then, and then there I was right with my eight by 10 view camera, my five by seven view camera hours in the dark room, my double weight fiber silver prints, my yes, my yes paste, my six palette knives that it took to get the glue onto the panel, <laughs> my double binding clips that I had to press cement blocks on the prints for two days to get them to glue flat, right? Like, so you have to kind of like apples and oranges, right? Like process is, is like work. And where do you want to put the work? Right. Mm -hmm. And I would never judge. And I would never say that there's only one way to do anything. I would never, that's not the type of artist I am. Um, wait, that's not the type of art teacher I am. So I am married to my process. Let's not get this confused, but I don't like to limit other people or control your choices and decisions. And I try to share as much information as I have about everything. Um, so for, for right now, just to repeat that, I'm my favorite papers are made by Hannah Mule. And I have been fortunate to be in a work relationship with them for, um, a little while now, like over 10 years. And my favorite papers are the photo rag, the rice paper, and um, the William Turner. And I like them all um, 90 GSM, which is fairly lightweight, and the 188 GSM. And the reasons that I like them is that they're easier on my printer. So printing on thicker paper on any ink, hand loaded inkjet paper is very hard on the printer, right? Because the way the printer works is that the nozzles go back and forth like this, right? Over the plate gap. So if the paper's thicker, it's just a lot more fiber and stuff coming off into the nozzles and just the machine has to navigate the heavier paper. So it's more wear and tear on your printer too the heavier paper. Um, and I used to really like the 308. Let's talk to about what if you're not going to mount a piece or what if you've done a painting or a drawing on paper? Does anybody in the group like to work just on paper and not always on the wood? Cause we could talk about that too. I would like to know more about that. Okay. So, so again, I would say the same, um, the same is both work, thin paper works and thick paper works. Jen, back to your question about when you first asked me about paper, I really want to make um, some pieces like, like Bonnie's pieces. Mm. Like, and I want to glue prints onto heavier paper. Like I would never try to put that heavy paper through my printer, mm -hmm. but, but my vision was to print on rice paper and then glue the two papers together and then wax them and mm -hmm. possibly even use like sewing or like some type of like hand stitching of the two papers together, like, like skins, because those law we were at a show, uh, well, not a show, we were at that workshop in, in Texas at the Encaustic Center and um, Bonnie does like sculpture. She does like 2D and 3D work. Yeah, she just posted pictures on Facebook today. That oh. she, she installed it somewhere in Dallas. Oh, that's awesome. That's really cool. It's a great show, but that paper is like so super thick paper, watercolor paper. And I think it could be cool to work with something like that, but I would do it, I would build up to it. So I would take the photo, glue it on the paper and then start painting it. I think would be my approach. But we can talk about working on paper. Um, it's, it's great. Um, and I think the nice thing about paper too is that you can glue post working on the paper, 
right? So I, I don't have any problems with just making a bunch of wax pieces on paper and then gluing them after I wax them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What would you glue them onto after? W whatever. Okay. Like uh, seriously, whatever you want. So I, uh, you could use um, found objects. You could glue them to wood panels. You could glue them to dye, dye bonds, sheets of metal. You could glue them to other papers. You could glue them to plexiglass or glass. Um, you could probably even glue them to fabric or canvas. Cool. And you could also sew them, stitch them, uh, link them, clip them, right? Um, so those are all possibilities too, right? So you guys should definitely know about, and I know Jen, you already know about her, but I'm gonna put Bonnie Leibowitz and I'm also gonna put um, uh, Patricia Sedgebrook. And she, so these ladies are both pioneers. They're my, they're my, they're my ladies in, in encaustic. They're, they both have places, encaustic places, right? Places specifically devoted to encaustic. I'm going to say places for encaustic. So Bonnie has the encaustic center and Patricia has the encaustic castle, uh, which is an artist resident like Airbnb artist studio in Lexington. And she offers um, residencies, residencies for artists to come there to Lexington and work in her studio with encaustics. Um, and that was, uh, really, I've been there twice and now I've been to Bonnie's. I mean, it's amazing. There's also the, there's an encaustic museum and center also in New Mexico. Carrie, do you know about that place? Yeah, I'm a member. Oh, good. And do they, do you take classes there or did you take classes? I, yes, I have taken classes there. Yeah. Yeah, so I was in a couple shows there and I'm gonna be a show, another show in Texas coming up soon. Okay, so any other questions on, um, any other questions on photos? I did not offer or even think to offer anything about the computer or photography um, I'm happy to talk about those things if you ladies want me to. Um, I'm, I'm definitely have mixed feelings about all of that. I'm uh, based on just time, time restrict. I mean, if I had a staff, if I had a staff of people, there are a lot of things I'd like to do, but I, sometimes it comes down to time right? Like what I could actually get done and the amount of time that I have and how, how I don't like to be just stuck in my upstairs office uh, on Photoshop and I don't like to just be shoot. So I try to balance these sort of parts of me that come back together in my final work. Does that make sense? So I don't, I think it's an unusual, I think I don't think our style is unusual, but I think it's multifaceted, right? Using mixed media, right? And I do think that sometimes it, it's kind of like the long jump where you're like, did I leave my foot there? Like, did I move with my body? Like, I, do you know what I'm saying? Where you're like, you start with an idea with a photograph and then you do all, you're like, did you, do you know where you're going? And did you get that, you know? So I try, um, I try to just shoot what I like and then pick what I like. And I have no guarantees that it's gonna work out in the studio with the wax. But um, I just keep trying. And I, I think that for me, the best thing that I've ever really done is just told myself that you need to just enjoy the process, you know, that I love what I do. And I love, I picked, I chose these things to go together. And 
I like them together. So just figuring out how to make them look the best that I can make them, right? And one of the other things that I do is I play in, in the studio and then I put things aside and I also repeat images. And I, I tell people this all the time and I don't know if they do it or if they just think that I'm wasting materials or, but if I like a photo, I print it a couple times and I paint it a couple times. I don't really ever expect myself to get it right the first time or to have to know what I want before I'm in it. Does that kind of, does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's start talking about materials and I'll give you a little tour of my studio of how I have my studio set up. Um, and you guys can ask me about that. So hopefully everybody got the basic supply list, which was really the griddle, the brushes, a container for the wax or a couple containers, um, the wax medium itself, a couple encaustic paints, a couple pigment sticks and optional, some optional things like some optional things. So does everybody ha need any questions about those materials? Okay. So there are more than one company that makes the wax medium and the wax medium is going to be like slightly yellow, right? Because of the resin, right? You're also dealing with um, wax that's been lightened, right? So it's probably not exactly how it came, you know, it probably was even darker than this. Like I always picture like wax, like the origin of wax, like original wax to be like more like beigey, right? I mean, not this dark, not like this dark, but oh, that's brown. This is brown, but I always picture it to be like more yellowy. Oh, here, I'll grab it. Here. Like this color, right? You know, I kind of picture wax being like this color, right? It's like kind of like baby poop, baby poop brown. <laughs> Like literally, right? Okay, so here I can hold it here. So, oh, is that good? Not, uh, I never know where my hand is, you guys. Wait. Oh. Oh, there it is. It's like earwax. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, and, and it, it's funny too. Like in the studio, the wax just gets kind of like dirty. It looks like something really old, like some old rock, right? It's like, what is that? All right. So I, um, I'm gonna, you guys, I'm gonna pin my tabletop. Let's see about this, pin this one. Okay. So um, I have just two, I like to use the two pan system and, um, oh, whoops, I'm gonna go this way. So you can see too, I have multiple brushes, okay? And I am definitely a multiple brush person. It doesn't mean that you have to be, but I definitely like more than one size brush. And so I, I prepare them all. Remember too, that before uh, you are ready to paint, it's going to take probably about, um, I would say at least 20 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes for your wax to heat up and melt, right? So when you first come out to the studio, I always turn my hot plate on and I have mine at a solid 200 degrees. Do you notice how this wax is like gray? It's gray, right? So this is what I call dirty wax. And I really love my dirty wax. I also just love wax and I don't ever throw anything out. So I try to use every drop. And right now what I'm doing is this is a, this is an aluminum, like a harder, thicker aluminum loaf pan. These are awesome. I don't like the tuna fish cans. Like this can drives me crazy because it only works for one size brush. That's why it drives me crazy, right? So only this little brush fits in here, which I guess is okay if I, but it just restricts me from using any brush. So that's why I like these bigger pans. 
And I don't worry about wasting wax because um, I'm going to use it all. I just know in my studio, um, I'm going to use it. So what I do with this gray stuff is I use this for a cleaning wax. Now, I don't buy slick wax or um, any of the or soy wax to clean my brushes. I clean my brushes with um, just dirty wax medium and I also paint with it. Okay, so I like to paint with dirty wax. It, it, um, that's just something that I do. So I'll show you how I do that. And I, I think that people, some people either agree with me on that and they go for my style or they're just like, absolutely not, no way. I'm not doing that. But the option to, to, the option to not doing this is doing um, what I call commitment color which I can't do because I'm such a blender. If you, when, as you get to know me better in the next couple of weeks, you'll see me paint, but my style is what's called blending where I like to take a color and a color and a little bit of this and blend all three together to get the color that I'm going to paint with. Mm -hmm. So I don't go like straight out of the tube. I'm more of a blending Right, so that's my style. So what I do is I, I just throw all my brushes after they're kind of warmed up in here. And I go from this, so it's kind, I guess if you were like a watercolorist or maybe even a, like when you have a, you know, a jar of water and you put all the brushes in the water to soften them up and take the immediate color out of them, that's what I'm doing. Okay, so here's my big pile of brushes. And they're all in there. Now, the hot plate you can see has a little bit of paint on it. So I just take a paper towel and I just can keep this surface clean by wiping it like this, right? And I just, the unfortunately I do, you don't, you can reuse these paper towels if you're feeling like, a, but I just sometimes throw them away. So now my hot plate is totally clean, right? I mean, technically though, the wax, like here's the wax on the paper towel, right? I could reuse these for sure. Like I could be keeping these around. I could reuse them. I could probably use the same. Actually, you know what? I think I'm actually gonna do that. I'm gonna stop throwing these away. <laughs> I'm gonna keep them, I'm for real. Because honestly, like I'm just like, Wax is such an organic, like natural thing to have around. It's kind of nice. All right, so I'm cleaning up my palette. Now you could have a pot. Sometimes I like to use, if I'm working on a larger piece, I might use something like this, right? This is actually like an old saucepan. I don't buy them like at a fancy kitchen store, but if I do ever see one at a thrift shop, I like the fairly thick ceramic ones. Um, or I guess this must be like not stainless. What do they call this one? Does anybody, I don't know what this one is. It's like, what's it called? Like Teflon maybe? Maybe. And you could get different sizes. I think that these loafy pans though are super cute and you can buy like 10 of them if you want the thinner ones, which are these. Um, the other nice thing about them is that you can pop the wax out of them, right? So like I have the, this side, I have this shape, like you can get any shape you want, right? I have this shape too, which is like thinner. So these come from the grocery store, right? And they're cheap. And what happens, uh, wait, I can show you, wait, hang on, let me grab one thing, hold on. So like at the end of the, at the end of the painting session, right? If I take all these brushes out of here, right? This is what I call, this is what I call mud, right? But it's a really pretty, it's actually, if I put this on white paper right now, which I actually will do for you in a second, it's a really pretty light green, right? So like nothing is to be wasted. I, and I, I think that like even my dirty, you know, my dirty disc discardable wax is beautiful. So it's kind of like, I'm very, 
very attached to my medium, right? Okay, so, but what I was gonna say is that with the aluminum pans, right? Because they're movable, I can take this wax that was from another day and I can pop it out. Did you guys see that? Mm -hmm. So I can save this, right? So this is like a cool, probably medium transparent, like tealy green. And I can put it on my wax paint table now. I can also snap it, right? I broke it in half. And technically like I could paint with it. Do you see how that works? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now like I can reuse it. So nothing is expendable, everything is usable, right? So um, this is kind of how I get set up. Now you will notice too, I put this wax medium in this tray and when you first put wax medium in a tray, it's gonna take a long time to melt. I don't know what, you know, it's probably just the, the heating point, but for especially the first time, like right now, this is, and you just fill this pan up, it just, it resists the heat. It's almost like it bonds together and just like, we're not gonna melt, <laughs> we're not melting. So it takes a little while. All right, so let's talk about some other stuff while that is melting. And Can I ask you a question, oh, Leah? The, please. Um, the paper towel, Bonnie mentioned that her paper towel with, was it the, the paint on it caught fire or smoldered in her garbage cans and to always run it under cold water? I keep thinking about that. Yeah, Is yeah, it, yeah. That's a good point. I think it's the pigment sticks. It's the oil. It's the oil and the pigment. It's not just, it's not the wax on its, on its own. Okay. I keep wondering about that. Okay. Yeah, it's these guys um it's these guys so once you start if you guys start using these pigment sticks it's these guys uh on the paper towels it's pigment sticks because they have oils and pigments now i don't i've i've been doing this for a long time i've never had that happen so um and i i'm always like laughing that off but watch it will happen to me one day <laughs> like but yeah you're supposed to oh and also like those those paper the paper towels too like if you're buying like good paper towels like viva or something you totally can re you don't have to throw them away i mean they're kind of like you know like a shop rag or a kitchen towel like right you can kind of like unfold it lay it out it might dry even a little bit and then you could probably reuse it i mean there might get a point to where it just shreds apart you know what i mean but I'm gonna try to like, see how I have this wax paper. I'm gonna try to like, I'm gonna keep that. Like now I see I can unfold it, right? And then theoretically I could what use it again, right? It'll just keep absorbing more wax and cleaning for me. I don't need to throw these away. Okay. So I'm gonna take a piece of white paper and I'm gonna demonstrate some brush strokes because I think that would be fun. Um, and I'm gonna kind of demo some paper samples while we're waiting for this wax to melt, okay? I'm also gonna show you guys the rest of my setup so that you see my studios. And let's talk about safety um, and ventilation. So I think that if you, and now I'm not a, I'm not a, you know, CDC and I'm not a, I'm not an art certified safety precaution authority okay but um from what i've read and from what i know as long as you have some ventilation some air moving around right you're not limited you're not limiting yourself to only breathing the fumes from the hot plate and you're also um not in like a tiny space i think you're fine you can keep your heat down on your hot plate. And right now there's like no visible fumes, right? If you see anything smoking or fuming off the hot plate, that could be a problem. So that just means maybe your hot plate is too hot. So you can turn the temperature down. Um, if you could just crack a window and maybe have a little fan on, if you're in like an office space, I think that would suffice. If you have, um, like, Celie, you said you were near a bathroom. Yeah. So it's possible that you have an extractor fan in the bathroom. Like some bathrooms have, for ventilation, yeah. have 
you could turn that on and open the door. Okay. That would um, help. That would probably be helpful for you. And then if you just had a room fan or a ceiling fan on circulating the air, that could also be helpful. Okay. I, I do have a room fan. Maybe okay. what I can do is close the outer bathroom door and leave the one between the studio and the bathroom open. Yeah. With the extractor with the fan extractor on. Fan. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yep. Exactly. So I, my studio is big. So I just feel like in terms of like the size of my studio and how much wax I'm using, I have plenty of airspace in here, right? So you can kind of evaluate, I would think by the size of your space. If you're in a very small space with the hot plate, you would want to be drawing the air away from you so that it's not all going into your mouth and into your lungs, right? For me, I'm in such a big space. I just don't feel like there's like, I'm in, you know, 2000 square feet, I, it's not coming right to me. Like it's getting cold, right? So kind of evaluate your size versus your air circulation. And I think we're all, go ahead. Do you have a question, Carrie? No. You good? Yeah. Okay. All right. So any, um, any other questions? I think too, when we start using the heat gun or the torch, you could, you know, maybe go outside if you want to do that burning outside we can talk about safe safe heat gunning and torching i mean i think you're safe um heat gunning the torch is stronger it's more it's hotter um and it's more likely to combust something right make something burst into flames so <laughs> you might want to do that outside or um on a metal tray Right, so oh, one of the things that I like to have in my studio, I'm just trying to think of like tricks of the trade, you guys. Uh, some oh, tricks of the trade. So one of the things I like to have in my studio is a cook, it's cookie trays, right? So they're very helpful um, to wax on, and you can buy them in different sizes. So if you know you're working like small, there's a number of reasons to work on a cookie tray. One of them is for like a really nice pour. So you can lay your piece on here. You can pour the wax on here and you can just like butter, take the wax up and put it back and recycle it. So that's cool. The other reason is just to paint on it and it's easy to clean up and you can recycle all the wax that doesn't, that comes off very easily. It keeps the wax clean because sometimes wax likes to get dirty, meaning like, if you're on a, like my work table right now is fairly dirty. And so any wax that gets on my table, when I pick it up, it'll, it will, dirt will stick to it, right? So if you wanna keep it cleaner or have your table cleaner, you can work on some type of a tray. You could also work on wax paper, which would also keep it cleaner and would make it easier to recycle the wax. If dirt is like, is, if dirt is an issue for you. Okay, which is reasonable. I mean, maybe you want the piece to be very clean and not have little things in it. Okay, um, I'm trying to think of other tricks of the trade. So my brushes are a variety of brushes from very inexpensive to very expensive. So let's see if we can identify them. <laughs> Does anybody know? No, I'm just kidding. This is the inexpensive one. And what's funny about, I have this new thing about my brushes. I give them haircuts. So, because I've been paint, so, so, okay. So in order to compensate for the inexpensive brush, I take scissors and I trim the bristles. Because what happens with the cheap br br brushes is that the bristles are so uneven and um, uneven is good if you want texture, but if you want to do anything smooth or continuous, you cannot do it with an uneven brush. So to cut corners, I like these little brushes because I can get them down the street at the hardware store. And so I buy them. And then I, do you see even like how, do you see even how like the, um, the sides are coming out? Do you see how the sides are coming out on the brush? That's going to affect the work. So I could cut them, cut them off. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I can control the brush a little bit. Now, if you don't feel like dealing with that, 
right? So I can literally trim the trim the brush. So I trim the brush this way. And you can just change the way the brush interacts with the wax by changing the bristles. Okay. So I was like that kooky girl that gave like my stuffed animals haircuts and stuff when I was little. <laughs> so it's just kind of like, okay. All right. So, and I like these little brushes. This is a one inch. So notice I have different sizes, right? You can also be painting with like, like, you know, re real paint. What I call, I call the little brushes real paint brushes, right? Because I like to give painters a lot of credit for what they do because it's actually like really hard painting, right? So the little brushes, you can use any little brush you want, like square brushes, round brushes, um, bushy brushes if you want little brushes, okay? I have hundreds of little brushes that have gone into the wax. I just don't have any of them out right now, but just make sure that your brushes are um, not synthetic because if they're synthetic, they're probably just like singe up in the wax, right? They'll just like curl up into a, like a little ball or something and you won't be able to paint with them. All right. Um, but definitely play around with brush sizes and brush um, texture, let's just call it, right? So like here's a beautiful, you know, wide, wide brush with very straight bristles. That's not, this is not a wax brush. Uh, oh, actually it's made, I don't know where I got this one actually. This is actually an RNF brush. So it is a wax brush. It's made by RNF. It's a lovely brush, right? This is a hockey brush. Right, and this is um, four inches, four inches, right? This is the one inch. Also notice the length of the handles, right? So that's kind of a big deal too, right? Notice the length of the handles and the width of the handle, okay? So if you're using a bigger brush, you're basically gonna get, um, I'm just gonna use this piece of white paper. Actually, let me grab one more piece of white paper, hang on. to get some extra i think it's nice i think it's nice to always just like practice on white paper so i keep all my scraps of paper around so let's just see what these different brushes do so this is this is that this is that this brush okay so this is what it does right i i do this all the time i always talk about like what brushes can do and I think I keep them around with me. I like to like practice with them before I do like a real thing, right? Also, I'm just playing around too with weight. So you can see from my mud. Also, you can see what a pretty color my mud, my mud is, right? It's kind of like a nice gray. And that was the green from the other wax that was just in that pot, right? Yeah, so once here, you put a little, a little like say a real paintbrush in your wax, is it forever uh -huh. dedicated to encaustic at that point? Yes. At, great question. Yes. Once a wax brush, always a wax brush. There's no coming back. Okay. Yeah. So that's why I was like, uh, I'm not putting any of these brushes in the wax because they're the only brushes I have left. This is what happens to brushes once they go in the wax. I mean, they're, you know, they're wax but they do come back when you heat them up, you know, when they cool down, they're hard, right? And they don't, but once they, once they melt, they, they, they're reusable for a long time. You just can't ever paint with them. They'll never be cool. You know, you can't get the wax off. Okay, so this is the hockey brush. So this will give you, you know, you got to think about it. Like this will give you four inches, right? And look how smooth that is, right? So this is the four inch hockey, nice and smooth, right? Now you can see at the end, this is just what the brush does naturally, right? Mm -hmm. So I highly recommend even for this first week of homework is just get some wax, right? Get some brushes, just get some scrap white paper and practice just brushing them, right? Just start to notice really 
what the brushes that you have, what they do, right? So we could literally label this, right? We could go, this is four inch hockey, right? And then you could post these on your like board, right? Or on your wall for the next couple of weeks. Like this is four inch hockey. This is what it looks like. So this is what it does when I lift up, right? This is what I do, does when, this is what happens when I go over the edge is it backflips and it makes this, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what it looks like when I touch it and move away, right? So this is what happens, okay? This is what happens here when I overlap, right? So this is, this is times two. Does everybody get that, right? Can't, I can't see it. You can't see it? Well, it's just small on that. If you hold it up like this, we could see it. No, because I'm using the tabletop. I'm not, you want me to hold it up? You want me to switch? Yeah, switch to your tabletop so that's bigger. My tabletop, oh, my tabletop should be bigger. Hold on. Wait, this is me. So this is it. Okay. Yeah, that's bigger. What, the, what we see is your tabletop as a somebody who's attending, so it's tiny. Oh, I didn't pin the tabletop. Wait, hold on. Let me pin the tabletop. I'm not sure. Wait, hold on. There you go. Oh, yeah. That's good. Do that. So this is the hockey, right? One time, lift it up two times, just right here, right? And then one time. And then this is when I, this is like pulled up fast, right? So you can see what kind of texture it makes, right? Mm -hmm. You can also see how it kind of gives you like a, it's interesting how this rectangular brush gives you these nice rounded corners. Did you guys notice that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool, right? All right, let's do the other one again. So do you like load your brush and then like skim it off on the edge always? Or do you just not? That's a really good question. So let's, let's see, this is this other, this is this other brush. This is, uh, I'm gonna say this is four, this is two inches. And this is a, um, I don't know what they call this brush. This is not a hockey. It's just called an, it's made by RNF. So I'll have to look it up, but it's probably just in their paint section and it's just a long haired bristle brush. So let's see what this one does. I, I went from the wax, Jen, right? I put it in the wax. I picked it up. I didn't tap it. Okay. So one of the things that you might see here and that's kind of cool is that you're going to see like right now, look what's happening is I'm, it's, it's like, I'm getting a drip here, mm -hmm. right? Cause it's coming off the end. And then I'm just going to lay it down. It's going to pull out and I'm pulling, right? And you'll start to feel it. And I'm going to move this camera. You'll start to feel it when it's, it's cooling. Like right now I stopped. So I'm stuck here, right? I'm literally stuck here. And when I take it away, I'm now going to have that texture, right? So this gave me like a lot of information. Like up here, I did raindrops. Here is where I landed and I got this piece of dirt in there, right? Hence the dirt conversation, wax likes dirt. It really does. I mean, I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm just saying it as a fact of life. Okay, so I pulled that out. Now I have that little space where it was, which is kind of cool, right? I have that little in, in space, 3D space. This is very thick. This is where I landed. Then this is super beautiful and smooth, right? And then at the end where I stopped, I've got like an imprint or like fossilization like of the end of the brush. So that's a lot of variation for one run, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's try something else, okay? So this is the two inch brush and like you could, you know, heavy, I would say heavy on the wax, right? Mm -hmm. And let's try something else. I'm gonna get another piece of white paper. So also notice like the color variations between these, all of these samples. And you can start to 
think about, you know, what would that look like over top of your photo, right? Do you want texture over your photo or smooth over your photo, right? I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna grab another piece of white. I love doing these types of, I almost call them like um, field studies, right? Where I'm sampling the brushes. Let's, now this is too, this is a 188 paper and this is a rice paper. So what else did you notice? What else did you notice between these two? What happened here? It absorbed more. Yeah, and what did that, and look at the paper up to the light. Transparent. It's, it's transparent, right. So look at this one. It's not, mm -hmm. not transparent. Wax on it, not transparent. Maybe a tiny little bit on the back, but basically not transparent. And this is 188. This is the rice paper, right? Totally transparent. Okay, so let's try the little, let's try the cheapy brush. Let's try the little brush, right? And look, now my wax medium is melted. Did you guys notice? Perfect timing. Look at that. Mm. Oh, I love it. Look how beautiful that is. Oh my God. If that's not a sight, it's just so pretty. I mean, seriously, it's like gold, liquid gold, right? Okay. So this brush melted, this is the one inch and it has, a. this is the dirty wax, right? All right. So this is just straight across. And this is sort of, and then I can crisscross, right? So what happens if I work in the same spot for a while? What's happening is I work in, it's definitely getting translucent, but it's also what? Building up texture. Yep, it's right. So I'm basically grooving it, right? Because this is still, even though, so this is smooth, right? Straight across. And then if I want, I can continue to move it, right? So I want you guys to practice these like make this look at this pattern right so i'm making like a pattern every other one right so i did smooth and then crisscross keep moving the brush keep moving the brush and it's fun because you'll see the wax as it's trying to cool down but you're like forcing it to move right leah do you think people who are like and i know this isn't your style at all but like people who are strict and like really into encaustic technique do they look at the raindrops and the drips as like bad technique or no they always celebrate that um i think that they um know what they want and they know how to handle it so if they want it they do it and if they don't they don't but it's not like a sign of like oh that's a novice because she has drips um i think you could look at um very accomplished and caustic artists who are purposely using the drip. I don't think you could identify the drip as, in terms of a uh, beginner, me, intermediate. Okay. I, 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 I don't, I think a good, I mean, I think that, I think from the outside, I mean, I think encaustic is a challenging medium. So if people are making successful pieces, they're probably just, they could be naturally good. The first, I mean, that's a hard one to answer. I, I love drips and I don't see drips as a novice thing. I mean, basically it's a technique where you're going into the material and you're, you know, you're dripping. I mean, right? Like, I think it's beautiful. I just didn't know if people who know more than I do would look at that and go, she obviously doesn't know how to handle the wax. <laughs> oh my God, no, I don't think any, I mean, I don't know that anybody would interpret that as that. And honestly, I can show you in that Joanne Matero book, next time we meet, that people make uh, drip. I mean, I think drip, drip, dripping and painting is beautiful. I don't know that that's a sign of, of a good or bad painter dripping. I think it's just a technique that anybody can use at any time. Um, okay, so let's do, so you guys got this one too, right? I want, but I want you to know all of these different, these different sets of brushes, right? So let's name them, right? This is like, a, I would call this like the long haul where you stop and put your brush down here, let it deposit, even let it drip off and then pull it 
And then if you stop at the end, you know that you're going to get something here, right? Now, technically, if now if you don't like it, right, you're going to be able to take it away, right? Do you see that? Mm -hmm. So you know you can take it away. A lot of times, I like the wax to give me challenges. So like this, I would have considered a challenge, but now I think it's beautiful. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, like with the drips, I just think knowing, I mean, being a good encaustic artist is just knowing which ones look good and that look good where they are, right? I don't think it's anything about having them or not having them that makes you a good painter. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, that, that, I don't think that if you like them, you like them and that's its style, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if I take them down, right, this is a razor blade, I can control how raised they are right? By shaving them, right? So we haven't, we, we're already, you know, talking about a lot of brushing wax. We're talking about removing wax. We're talking about blending wax and we haven't even introduced heat, right? We're still just using a brush and two tools, right? I got a razor blade and a scraping tool, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you wanted to try a second layer, right? Just to see what that would look like, right? I, so I put, applied this, I scraped it down. Now, do you think it's more beautiful? I mean, do you like the, do you just like this better? Does it look more integrated? I like both. You liked both? You liked it 3D and flat. So now this to me is, is where I like wish you guys could be here. But basically what happened when I shaved it was that I maintained the texture of the drops, but I don't have them raised. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I can still see the circles, but I don't have to deal with the bumpiness of the circles. That's what I like. I like to, I like the variations of tone and and shape but i don't like to feel them with my hand and i don't like to see all of that action going on mm. i want it to look textured but feel smooth mm -hmm. okay so before we go tonight it's, i can't even believe it, it's almost eight o'clock but let's do just wax medium okay so these were dirty you guys probably aren't even gonna have anything dirty because you haven't painted with any or maybe jen ha, maybe carrie has but steely hasn't even done any encaustic painting at all so she's just going to be dealing with wax medium i'm going to grab one more piece of paper i'll be right back So I don't throw away, um, when I tear photos too, I like to keep all these pieces, edges pieces, but if you just have, you could do this practice work on any type of white paper, um, or yeah, you could even just do drawing paper. If you have any drawing paper in your studio, these are edges from photo, photo paper, right? So when I, prints i keep the i tear i keep the edges i always say like one day i'm going to do a big weaving <laughs> like weave them all to paint them all and then weave them all together like a big huge encaustic uh strip you know like the strip weaving yeah i just think that'd be so cool all right so if i don't i'm gonna have to clean my brushes for a second so this is going to be a cute little demo real quick on cleaning brushes and then we're going to wrap up for tonight because you guys have been awesome and we've been very busy so so to clean my brushes i swish them around in the mud swish 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 wait hold on let me move my camera okay swish 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 in the mud right and tap now do you see how I, now jen i'm tapping all the wax mm -hmm. out on the side and then I'm brushing on the paper towel, right? Sometimes I brush on my apron. 
<laughs> so a lot of my apron, I don't care because these are my wax aprons, but they work just as well and it's not as wasteful. So I just brush on my apron. And then if you wanna just check to make sure it's clean, just put press, did you guys see that? I just squish mm -hmm. it, I squish it. You can also take a paint scraper and also extract the paint like that. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. Did you see that? So the so all the dirty paint is on the scraper. Okay, now my brush is clean. And you know what's cool is that once the it's warm, it's kind of fun to play with it because it's movable and it feels really kind of cool. It's kind of like sticky, <laughs> but like movable. <laughs> Right. So, and then you can clean it even with your hands. So, and it's, it's fun to play with it once it's not hard anymore. All right. So now I know this is clean. Also notice this one. I didn't trim this. This is a hockey brush, but notice it's, it's about one inch long and fairly even, right? Even. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the wax medium, <clears throat> in the wax medium, and this is going to make a perfectly beautiful, right? So the, this is just wax medium, right? And I'm going to go straight, Jen, straight. So yeah, if I lift the brush straight out of here, look at all that wax, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I can do that. If I tilt the brush like that and let it run off, I'm going to have a still pretty good load, but it's not going to drip. So let's see if I can do a dripless. Down and smooth, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can see here at the end. Now this is harder to see, right? Because no. it's really hard to see. Oh, there you go. Can you see it now? No. So I definitely got a lift, uh, like a lift off mark here. Right. But, <laughs> but a beautiful entry, like not a great exit, but again, remember the hockey brush? Look how beautiful, beautiful entry, gorgeous little rounded corner here right bad exit right okay so good mm -hmm. on good on the in bad on the out all right so let's try that one let's try that one in another way so let's try that one like smooth across and then oh and i tapped this time so jen i tapped <laughs> did you notice that i tapped yeah. now also i tap so you can can you see this brush it's bent it's definitely bent this way so mm -hmm. I, I flip it over and I tap it to the heavy side. I also pulling out the extra bristles. Okay, so I brush it off the extra and I'm gonna do the, the hashtag. I'm gonna keep going, I'm gonna keep going, I'm gonna keep going. Okay, now I'm gonna do the smooth. And now I'm gonna do the hashtag. Okay, so these are super fun exercises that you guys could do this week just with wax medium. And you can also try once they cool, if you want to, you know, use a tool, a pottery, a pottery tool, right? Or a razor blade. I have a number, I just buy those, um, like couple tools, like the wood tool, the scraper tool, they come in a kit. Um, and you can start playing around after it's cooled down with maybe removing a little bit of wax, right? So what does that look like? Like say here where I had the bad exit, right? Right here, do you see where it's bumpy? Mm -hmm. This, this is what I wanna get rid of. Wait, I'm just trying to figure out. This is what I want to get rid of right here. So I could just take it like this and scrape it back. Okay. So really controlling the brush. And then if you want to, you can add more than one layer to this just to see what it looks like. Now, technically, I'm going to throw one more idea out on the last two minutes. And that is when you do one coat like this, I don't feel like you need to fuse it. But if you do a second coat, then technically you're supposed to fuse one to one, right? So I did algebra today with, with this. I haven't done algebra in a really long time. So 
you guys, <laughs> if you remember algebra, no. Um, so paper is just one layer. And then when you just add wax to it, I don't really consider that a, a, a layer, but when you add another layer of wax to wax, that's a layer. So technically if I add, you know, smooth to this, then I would want to start diffusing, right? And what is really nice too, is once you get that second layer on, you can start to see sort of what is happening with the, like the positive and negative spaces of where the brush is going and sort of how the wax is acting, right? And how it's acting in a layer, right? So you can sort of see like this one, I put smooth over textured and I love the sort of juxtaposition that's happening between this smooth with the textured underneath, okay? Mm -hmm. So right from the very beginning, what is the first thing that you're thinking about right now? Like, I know what I'm thinking about. What are you thinking about? I'm thinking about another art medium that this reminds me of. Mm. Is it ceramics? Um, yeah, maybe like a coil pot where you're like- just, Yeah, thinking about texture under glaze, kind of. Beautiful. I was thinking about weaving, right? So I was thinking about mm. like the way you take like, You'd, you'd weave like two different threads together. So like maybe one that was like loose and one that was tight so that they would kind of like show each other off, right? So this one was textured, this was smooth. So they're kind of having, you know, uh, a contrasty relationship so you can see the difference between the two. Okay, so I'm gonna end there for tonight. Any questions before we go? What are you going to do with that paint that's in the corner on your griddle? Like, do you save that or do you? Yeah, for some reason I'm saving that. I think I just love that color. So sometimes for me, um, that's a remnant of another day of painting. And um, we're going to talk about hot plates, you know, maybe having more than one hot plate for different color palettes. Mm -hmm. So if you work that way, you could have like a warm hot plate and then you could technically keep it right and just okay. keep reheating it you don't have to wipe off your hot plate at the end of a session okay that's not a rule you know only if you're like done i don't know where i can't what the heck i wait hold on so so like if i was going to shut this down now for the night the one thing i would do Actually, I'm glad you asked me that question. The one thing I would do is take the wax brushes out. Okay. Would you clean them all or just take them out? These that are in the mud, you could clean them all, but most of the time I don't have time for that. Yeah. So I'm going to put them back on the pot that they came out of. So they go back into the pot. So I know that this one is clean because I'm going to lay it on top of the clean one. Does that make sense? And yeah. I'm gonna, these guys came out of the mud. So you can hold them up like this, but don't let them cool in the wax because this is what, do you see how terribly curly this brush is? Mm -hmm. You don't want that with your brushes. You see, because this one's gotten left in the wax. And so it literally gets like bent. Okay. So you want them to cool flat like this and on top of the, on top of like, on top. So that's how I leave my palette at the end of the night. And um, I wouldn't leave these here either. I would lift them off the palette. You don't, cause the, uh, I mean, if you left them here, leave them, do you see what I'm doing? If you leave them on the palette, they're gonna, con you can't pull them off. If you pull them off after they've cooled, you'll pull the bristles out of them. So mm -hmm. lift, lift them. I just think it's easier just to lift them. I know that brush is dirty and this brush is dirty too. So I could just put it on top here. So, so all those people that have those little tins and they keep one brush in each tin. Yeah, you can do that. They, yeah. But they just leave them in there and it hardens in there, doesn't it? Yep, they leave them in there and it hardens in there. I don't like to do that. I feel like it, it bends the brushes. Yeah, I don't think I would either, but. But, uh, but we'll look at some pictures next week. And actually, if you can remind me, if someone can remind me to talk about color palettes. So what, what Jen was 
saying, you guys, is that like, remember how I had the green in here? And I'm sure if, cause Carrie's been to like um, the museum, other, what they could just put a brush in here and this could just be the green paint. But for me, that means that I have to like take all the colors that I might paint with and melt them all to be ready to paint or to know which colors I was gonna paint. I just don't have that type of like foresight. I'm more impulsive and I, in a way, only if I'm painting really big, do I need that much wax paint at one time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like I, I, only if I'm painting like four foot by six foot, do I need a whole container of this in a color, you know? Mm -hmm. Otherwise I can get by on my palette. And we can talk about that too. We can talk about the changes that happen when you go from small to big, right? Mm -hmm. So does anybody really wanna work big, like really big? It's pretty cool. I'm thinking about it, I'm intimidated by it. I, I think it's worth a try. I really think that it, it teaches you a lot, you know, and it forces you to be very resourceful. You have to like try hard. <laughs> All right. Um, so I will, uh, I'm gonna convert the Zoom. I'm gonna wait here, I'm gonna stop recording us.